The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, I don't know whether you can hear in the, the background. It's very, very low. You won't be able to hear it. But um, but Barney, Barney is chewing. Barney, see, I'm getting no response because he's chewing a pig's ear. Do, do your dogs chew pig's ears? They did once and only once. And Barney will, <laughs> Barney will love them forever. But I you know. will only have one he's ever the, in your the, house because those dog. things smell like the bowels of hell. Oh, he's had a couple of these pig's ears already. Oh. It's, it, it's the uh, it's the pig's trotters that, that worry me. Oh, they stink <laughs> even worse, yeah. <laughs> Ugh, gross, thing, gross, 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 thing, gross, gross. What's the most disgusting thing you've ever put in your mouth, Kev? Careful with, <laughs> careful with the answer. <laughs> well, it's the, well, I, I, tell, I know the answer to that, actually. I do know the answer to that. It was on a rugby tour in Portugal. Oh, no, I don't know if I want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a uh, concoction. Yep. It was a, uh, in a tin, but yep. I had to kind of drink it. Oh. It was cat, Portuguese cat food, yep. Marmite, oh. <laughs> Guinness. Guinness, so Portuguese soda cat, water. cat food. So we missed that, but cat food, Guinness. Marmite, Marmite, soda water, yeah. and some, uh, what's that stuff you put in um, uh, Bloody Mary's drinks, make it spicy? Um, uh, Worcester sauce. Worcester, yeah, lots of Worcester sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that- the cat food was the best part. <laughs> oh, oh, did it liquidise? Oh, that's disgusting. The Fuji cast. Did, it, did they liquidise it first, Kev, or what? Yeah, to the point of it being drinkable, but still malleable and lumpy enough for it to be awful. <laughs> Uh, I can't beat that. I was about to serve I love some. those boys. I miss those boys. Yeah, well, those the, rug- the, days. the rugby boys, yeah. 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 Where did you, do you not... Six Nations is back on. I, well, no, yeah. Well, the weekend's just gone, so I don't know what... We don't know what any of the scores were. Who's play, who would who would have been playing who at the weekend, Kev? I, I, you know what? I don't know, because um, I, I'm going to look it up right now, because uh, the boys emailed me yesterday and said, come on, we've got to come around to your studio on Saturday and watch rugby and I'm like hang on what's this what, who's, who's want, doing what if you want, uh, if you Ireland want. Wales is the first game okay Ooh. Ooh, Ireland I, I'm, I'm going to make predictions right this is my predictions of the games that have just happened that you won't have known we're recording this will be interesting so if you get these right Kev uh, we're coming to you for the lottery numbers for next week I'm going to say Ireland are going to beat Wales by 25 points right okay Next game is, uh, well, the next Saturday game is Scotland v England. And I'm actually going to put my my arm on the line and say Scotland by nine. Oh, Kev. Well, France, Italy. I'm going to say, well, it's Italy in it. So France by 300. <laughs> Kev. Right, welcome to the, the, the Fuji Cast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag, and of course, also through the Fuji Cast private Facebook group that you're welcome to become a part of. If you're emailing in, then the address, as always, is click at fujicast.co.uk. Um, we've got some bumps to the fronts this week, haven't we? We have one. Um, oh, and very quickly, second part, second part of Simon Blakesley's chat. Um, so uh, and there's there's quite a sort of I I think when when we get toward the end of uh, today's interview, um, it it ends on a sort of a note which is um, which is all about legacy and and all about doing things with your folks. But uh, that's to come. So one bump to the front. Yeah, <laughs> I've lost it. Yeah. <laughs> I had it just then. One job, Mullins. Uh, one job. How are you I gonna... got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Right. Go so then. before we do the bump to the front, uh, I shall also read out the uh, the new patron members. So very kindly, thank you very much if you are a patron member. If you don't know how to be a patron member, you just go to patron.com. Um, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Oh, Fujicast, I guess, something like that. Would anyway, so it's write, Fujicast patron. Would somebody write this stuff down for Mullins and give it to him, <laughs> like a crib sheet? And, uh, and yeah, and then you can give us some money. Um, anyway, so the new names, <laughs> the new names since uh, the end of November are Tim, Tim Binder, Phil Collier. I yeah. still want to say Phil Collins. Phil Collins. Uh, Tony Hodgson, uh, Joe Houghton, David Swales, Mark Farringdon, David Pottinger, and Jody T. Cachillo. Good. There we go. Thank you very much, you guys. Bills. And the bump to the front, then, Kev. How, by the way, how are you going to cope with the rugby thing? You've, you've, uh, you're into your second month of um, of dry mullins, yeah. and uh, of course, all the boys are descending upon the the studio with their their Welsh rugby flags, without a clue, of course, that they're they're actually coming for a, a tea and scones, a tea and scones, tea and scones. Is it scone or scone? Tea and tea and scones party. They can do whatever they want. They won't be wearing waving Welsh flags, that's for sure, because they're all English. But um, ah, okay. 
apart from Gareth, but he's in America. Um, okay. And Wayne, he's from he, he's he's from Stoke, which doesn't really it's not really anywhere, is it? Stoke. Well, it's, Stoke. I suppose it's, um, it's close-ish to Wales. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> right. So um, yes, I don't know. I don't care. I'm not. I'm not fussed about the drinking thing. So um, I, I should. I tell you what's nice. So Erdinger. Erdinger. That's very nice, non-alcoholic. And Aldi that? do really nice non-alcoholic stuff. Uh, you get six bottles for two pound forty-five. Whereas you go down the co-op, you get the worst non-alcoholic drink. I think is the um, San Miguel Zero. Horrible. You don't like that one. Uh, it's like six quid for four bottles. Have you tried the Guinness? Have you tried the Guinness the Zero? Yet? I haven't been able to get hold of that yet. Oh, that's very nice. See, it hasn't seen. It hasn't reached the Shire. Obviously, you have to go the the right end of the box. Otherwise, you end up drinking the alcoholic ones like I did. But uh, mm. otherwise, I noticed that Aldi very very quickly, Kev. Before we do the uh, the bump to the front there, Aldi have won the big the big food battle of. The, was it Aldi or was it Lidl? Uh, yeah, with Lidl. the cake company, the cake Marks company. and Spencers. Yeah, they yeah. won it. Yeah. So now they're allowed to make their own caterpillar cakes. What a I mean, stupid world we live in. I mean, in. really, with uh, have we not cured pestilence um, that we should have time to be arguing about caterpillars? Yes. <laughs> anyway, let's not give it credence. Uh, Stephen Anker, bumped to the front. He says, hi, folks. Still loving the podcast, which is the best production value in town. RQQ, <laughs> relatively quick question. Oh, Lots of talk of IBIS, and I know Kev uses it at weddings, but what I don't really understand is how much use it can really be. I get that it allows shooting in lower light at slower shutter speeds, but surely this is not helpful if there are any risk of subject movement causing blur. Many thanks, Stephen Anker. Well, we, we kind of talked about IBIS last week with the, uh, the X-T4. And you, you decided that it makes a lot of difference to you. Yeah, I mean, he's right. IBIS means diddly squat if everything in front of you is moving. doesn't matter how much is going to help you slow your shutter speed down. But it does mean that, for example, you can shoot at maybe 1 125th of a second instead of having to w- um, shoot at 1 60th of a second. So what may have been blurry in the uh, drinks reception... <laughs> <laughs> is uh, is less likely to be blurry because you're shooting at a faster shutter speed um, natively. So that's how you have to think about it. So you, you're dead right. Obviously, if if people are sprinting around and everything, it's not going to happen. But it'll be, there will be a, appear to be a little less blurry. Objects in the rear view mirror may appear closer than they actually are. And it's the same with IBIS. What's the what's the um, the slow the slowest shutter speed that you're comfortable with? What handheld? Yeah. Uh, well, it, I mean, if it's people, if it's a wedding, probably one sixtieth. Yeah. If I hold my breath and breathe in and hold onto a wall with my other hand, and you know all that kind of stuff, wear my posh shoes. Um, but yeah, other than other than that, I, I'm a one one twenty fifth man myself. Is that is that how well, you? That's set, my need. That's my default. One yeah. one twenty fifth. I is typically that, have my hour to ISO set to one one twenty fifth. And you shoot fairly wide, don't you? Yeah. So I'm happy for my ISO to to go through the roof as well. Wander around and do what he wants to do. Yeah. Uh, Peter Johnson. Hi, Neil. Hi, Kev. Are we through the pandemic yet? I don't know. Yes. Are we? Is it gone? Yeah. Well, mm, there are some countries. I mean, I was reading about Tonga that are are closing down for five cases. And and I don't know by the time this goes out that they they may well indeed have more. But, um, I mean, obviously, they've had their their issues, haven't they? That's been brought in by the AIDS people. I know. Which is always going to happen. Yeah. But, yes, uh, honestly... Do you know what I say to COVID? Shut the door on your way out. Go away. <laughs> I wonder what you were going to say. Desperate to swear, but I'm, not, I'm trying not to. I'm, I'm, right. I'm on a, I'm I, on a swear. Go slow. Well, well, we always um, bleep you out anyway, Kev. All right then, f- you COVID. <laughs> It does take five minutes of time to bleep you out, though, once I've found a funny sound effect to go with it. Uh, all right, I'm going to start saying <laughs> really long Welsh words, swear words. <laughs> Don't you dare. Um, hi, Neil. Hi, Kev, says Pete. Oh, yeah, we've done the pandemic bit. But that's not the question. Ah, I currently use X-Pro 2 and X-H1. X-Pro for out and about, X-H1 for landscapes, and now I want to start photographing wildlife again, mainly birds. I used to shoot with... Uh, Oh, have I got the... Yeah, it's here. I used to shoot with... Nikon. And have the older 300mm prime that I attached to my... Nikon. Which worked really quite nicely. I'm looking at either the 100-400, which could be obvious, uh, an obvious choice, or the 50-140 to 140 with the option of um, a 1.4 teleconverter. Price isn't really the factor here. A good condition secondhand. They're not too far apart, actually. Which do you think will be more beneficial to get started with? All the best from Peter Johnson in County Durham. I, can I be totally honest and say I didn't really listen to the question again? Sorry. <laughs> I'm really what, sorry. It's what, just... <laughs> what's going on in your life today, Kev? 
is Rosa is today they've got a day off school, not a day off school, a day of distance learning because they've got no teachers in school because <laughs> the COVID thing. Mm. So she's her and Freddie are coming to the studio to do their schooling today. Oh my word! What, what uh, right now? Do we need to help them with homework while we're doing this podcast? Oh no 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 no! Like homeschooling means that they they put their Zoom thing on and yeah. then they look at their phones under the table. Um, <laughs> so that that will happen in the other room. But I think I thought I heard them appear in, but no, they didn't. It, it sounds like it wasn't them in the end, no. which mean, meant I totally missed the question. I'm really sorry because I was going to say to them, "Shh, don't! I'm on the podcast." Question. I could edit that bit out, but I think that sounds more amusing because it's real life. At it, some point, they are going to clamorously. That's right. When they <coughs> clutter through, through, and then then you can give them uh, lessons. We'll listen to you for a while. <laughs> Te- teacher Kev, yeah. um, X Pro. Right here we are. You ready, Kev? Yeah. Um, X Pro for oh yeah, uh, I use X Pro two and X H one. Yes, X Pro for out and about. X H one for landscapes, and he wants to start shooting wildlife, birds mainly. He, he used to shoot with the standby Nikon. and had the older 300mm Prime, which was on the Nikon. Uh, which was ni- nice. I'm looking at either the 100 to 400, which could be an obvious choice, or the 50 to 140 with the option of the 1.4 teleconverter. Um, price is not the big issue here. Um, what would you suggest? 50 to 140. With the teleconverter? Yeah. Why would you do that one? Because, well, just because it's a bit longer, isn't it, with that teleconverter? Yeah. And I think that that's like the premium, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's like the premium lens choice with that teleconverter. And and if price really is no option, then go premium. Well, I've, I've, I've never ever used teleconverters. I've always been, uh, I've, for some reason, been warned off teleconverters. Is there a reason for that? Uh, I've used them. Um, they seem to be good. Have I used the, no, I've used the macro macro converters. Right. So to get really close up stuff. Um, I don't have any teleconverters. Look. No found something I haven't got. I don't have any teleconverters, but None, I do have the In that magic, um, uh, magic cupboard that you have. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's got um, all sorts of stuff in there that I don't use, but it doesn't have teleconverters. So we're going for the 140 with the, uh, the, the 50 to 140 with the 1.4 teleconverter. That, that's, yeah, and I think that's I, Alan, Hughes, uh, Alan Hughes, Alan Hughes, Alan Hewitt uses that. Does he? Yeah, oh. say that really quickly. Alan Hewitt uses that. Sure. <laughs> well, it wasn't really a tongue twister, to be fair, Kev. <laughs> it wasn't quite like drinks deception, was it? Uh, yeah. Go on then, your question. From, oh, from, oh, God. From, from Facebook. Blimey, that's uh, throw me again. I'm opening my vitamins. Um, <laughs> it's, it's nice that Kev's joined us on the Fujicast. I haven't even got my Facebook page open. <laughs> Open the Facebook. I was doing the Patreon stuff. Oh, I see. Right. I'll let the dog out while you do the Facebook. Okay, okay. Uh, David Swales, this is posted 22 hours ago. I like to, I like to read out the last time the, the question one. was posted. Yeah. Hi both. Hope you're doing well. I've just started using the next pro three alongside the next T three and have noticed that the color rendition through the EVF looks slightly different on the mm. X pro three. Yeah. Even when both are set to Astia and auto white balance, the X pro three display seems to be a bit warmer. This isn't a problem as final images from both are consistent as I shoot raw. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a t-shirt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they both pretty much the same camera on the inside. So I just wondered why the EVF display is ever so slightly different. Thanks a bunch. David in Northampton. Shop. Yeah. Now I have the same, the very same problem with my um, X 100 V Kev. The, the, Compared co- to- the color rendition in the in Well, it just, it's entirely different um, to uh, to the X Pro One. I know we're not. I know this is not X for X. I know it, Kev. But the um, but the EVF for the X Pro One seems to be so much more accurate than the the X One Hundred V has ever been. The X One Hundred V is is really cold, and it's it's just it, it, it doesn't resemble at all what comes out of the the camera eventually. So again, I, I've done that thing of um, well, I, I'm not too worried because the the eventual result is really nice, but. But it's ne- it's never been correct in the EVF. Uh, what your JPEGs? Even yep. your JPEGs are not. Yep. Yep. There's yep. something wrong. You've got something set weird in your 100 dB because you can change the temperature and everything of your EVF in the 100 V. Right. It should be. It should be. I can understand why there's a difference between two cameras, and I'll explain that in a moment. But ultimately, what you see through the EVF should be pretty much the same as what the jpegs are they won't be quite the jpegs won't be as contrasty when you're looking at them on a on a editing screen because obviously an evf is backlit it's got uh you know electronic fairies in there brightening it up with their their pedaling yeah all that kind of stuff so it won't be as contrasty it's like looking through a cinema screen isn't it um but they should be the color and everything should be damn sight 
That's Spot on the, for JPEGs. It's the color that's the. Now I have reset the camera a couple of times, and I've never been into to the menu to to uh, where the EVF color shift could be. I would have thought that would have reset as well. Ha, have a, it should have done, yeah. But have a dig around. It depends which reset because there's two ways of resetting. But have a dig around um, in your settings. That should there's there's definitely something askew there. Are not but, all resets equal then? Uh, well, there's a there's a uh, shooting reset and a menu reset. Ah. So there's two types of resets. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so no, not all resets are equal in Fujifilm world. And the, the, so the yeah. So the reason why it's not well, this is my my thought process on this. Don't know for sure. The reason why it's not going to be the same, why you're seeing slightly different between the X Pro Three and the ET and the XT Three, slightly right. different, yeah. is my. So I'm ge- I'm guessing this is because yes, it's the same sensors inside and the same um, processor and everything. But if you look at the specifications for both cameras. The um, uh, the EVFs are slightly different, so there's more millions of dots per inch or different oh. color, 32 billion color things and yeah. stuff like that on some of them. And on others, there's slightly less or slightly more. So I, I think you'll find it's probably to do with the difference in the specification of the EVF, which explains why you see very, 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 very slightly. It shouldn't be too much. Yeah. Um, that's what I think is the answer. Okay. I might be wrong. No, I'm, you're you're generally really good with things like this, Kev. I trust you. In, in that Kev, is my thought process on in, that. In Kev, we trust Paul. Oh uh, yeah, Paul McIlwain. Um, hi, fellas. Question for the show. I love portrait photography and have explored this with family and friends and have set up a small home studio in my garage. My dream is to become a professional portrait photographer, but I need to uh, need to improve and possibly formally study portraiture or at least get more experience of lighting and sets. Any, any suggestions as to how best proceed before offering my services to, to clients? He gave us a, a website address, which I, I know at the moment we can't repeat on the uh, the show page because we've got some issues with that. So I'll, I'll read it. It's paulmckilwainphoto.com. So it's M-C-I-L-W-A-I-N-E um, dot com forward slash people. I'm going to click on it here. Just have a little look myself. Oh, been doing some fine stuff there. Low and high key and cute dogs. So, um, any suggestions, Kev, or, or what what he should do before uh, before? I mean, it looks to me. I'm looking at these pictures now, thinking, well, this looks to me like you've unleashed yourself on the paying public and the work you're doing for me. Was the email sent in? Um, <laughs> 2016. No, no, no. It was, it was the end end of the year, start of the year, sort of sort of. Subsequently, thing. won 64 SWPP awards. He's on the speaking <laughs> scene at WPPI. Yeah, he sent it. In 19, <laughs> released some presets. 19, and they're doing workshops. 1983. That's a, yes. <laughs> Um, no, so I mean, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking you look like you know what you're doing. Your lighting ratios look right when you photograph against a dark. But there's a perfect example here of a guy in an uh, American um, football shirt here, which is dark, and you've placed him against a dark background, but you've managed to bring him out, and you've you've obviously got some sort of hair light uh, in operation here. So, um, to me, it looks like. <laughs> Looks like you know what you're doing. Uh, well, there you go. So I can't see that right now because I, I didn't write it down. But um, yeah, I mean, the other thing is obviously the, the standard thing is, you know, get your kids, your wife, your husband, your boyfriends, girlfriends, auntie, uncles, all that kind of stuff to practice. Or you could, my mate Dave Sturdy, who is in the office opposite me now, in fact, in my old unit, right. he's got a mannequin in his window that stares at me. It's a bit and spooky. A real mannequin. Yeah. And it's oh. dressed in Guns N' Roses outfit. So uh, you could get a mannequin and practice on a mannequin because that's what I'm going to be doing. Are you um, for your portraiture work? Well, yeah, just because I've always fancied taking a picture of a mannequin in a Guns N' Roses outfit. <laughs> well, it's a very, it's a, it's a very defined project, that Kev. Um, uh, it's quite yeah, niche. no, because uh, <laughs> well, I've got this studio that I've never done any studio stuff in, apart yeah. from one shoot. Well, yeah. So <laughs> maybe at one point I'll think about that. But uh, yeah, but I've got my eyes on the mannequin. Yeah, because that's perfect, isn't it? It's life size. Well, not, I mean, not, I wouldn't say 100. It's probably like three quarter size, but you can use that. It's not going to answer you back. It's not going to move. It's not going to sweat. And then it's, you can, you can practice it because that's all it is ultimately, isn't it? Practicing the lighting, the, the posing and the modeling and everything. Yes, that's also a thing. Um, although that's something that you, you either do or you don't. I mean, if I'm, I'm not the kind of, even if I was doing portrait shoot, of which I've done a few, I would, I'm not the kind of person to say, look at me, stick, stick your leg flag out, put your, you know, poke your tongue out, do this, do that. 
I just say, look at me. But in, ter- in terms of... <laughs> look it's at the me. Lighting, it's the lighting that I, I, I need to... Look at me, uh, click. Get right at look, look at me, at the beginning. click. Look at, look at me, click. Uh, Next, give me like, your money. Y- Josef Karsh, he, uh, he very rarely, I, I believe, wanted to engage in conversation with his uh, subjects. And if he did, he invariably told them off. I, I think that sounds like you, Kev, then. Look at me. Look at me. I said, look at me. Thank you. Yeah. Rick. What was it? Um, £100, pound, it please. Was, I read the other day it was, um, what's his majiggy um, thingy, Anton Corbyn. Yes. He said, now oh, I'm probably going to get this all pants around neck. He said, <laughs> I don't photograph my subjects to make them look beautiful. Yeah. I photograph them to make them look interesting. Ooh. Yeah. So, well, I like that. Yeah, I like that. And yeah, in, that's that's it. And in terms of lighting, well, you know, you don't have to go uber complex when you look at some of these. Uh, I mean, Use of Karsh is, a, is another great example. Uh, Platon, who we've talked about before, is is um, usually quite simple with his lighting setup. Um, yeah. Your your friend Zach uh, Zach, yeah, he uh, he's done some great videos actually on on lighting. Which uh, one light one light workshop one is light called one light workshop. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what it says on the tin. It definitely it. one light workshops. One light workshop, and uh, yeah. So, well, good luck, Paul. But um, I, I'm looking at your work now. I'm pff, honestly, really, I, when when I clicked on that link, I was thinking. I, to be fair, I've clicked on the link before, so I kind of knew what was coming. But when I clicked on the link, I was expecting to say, "Okay, this is great, but maybe we need to work towards this." But when I saw it, I thought, "Wow, dear, he's." He really has been working hard at it. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Good work, good work. Right, your question, Kev. Or oh, have we got time, actually? I think it might be uh, time for the interview. Yes, it's um, it's Simon Blakesley. Now, um, we spoke with Simon last week for part one. Um, he is um, he's a photographer working in the Yukon. He, he uses several systems. He uses... Yukon. ...alongside um, his Fujifilm um, equipment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we as we tackle part two uh, with our guest Simon Blakesley. This might sound strange, but um, in the same way, Simon, those who shoot motorsport will say they they try to position themselves around the track to capture a car's most dynamic angle. Do aircraft have a best side? Yes. It depends on which aircraft, uh, and and I'll qualify that. Most of the jet aircraft that I shoot. Um, I do like to have the sunny side facing me, pref- preferably. Uh, if I'm shooting float aircraft, backlit is best because then you're getting that that conglomeration of spray. You're yeah. getting the prop tip vortices, which otherwise you wouldn't see um, were, were it not backlit. So early in the morning and backlit for me is often what I'll do with float planes. Um, but with most jet aircraft, certainly it's going to be the sunny side if I can get to it. Um, and if not, I'd be more perhaps looking for a silhouette kind of shot. Last year's Skies Photo Contest brought a first place for you. Well done. Um, that, that, that incredible long exposure shot, you're looking up for the stars, uh, then banging a dab of flash. I'm making it sound so simple here. As, <laughs> as, a, as an aircraft comes over the top of you to land, um, what kind of planning and difficulty does a shot like that have? Because you can't simply put yourself on the approach path of a commercial jetliner uh, and activate huge strobe flashes uh, as you wish, can you? No, and you've, you've touched upon a few very important points. How it came about was I had done light streak photography in the past, just yeah. where it was the jet, the time exposure and the light streaks. And I thought, well, that's great, but that could really be anybody's jet. You don't know which aircraft it is. And so I was flying back on Air North and I was sitting in the cockpit uh, with um, two of the the pilots that I know well. And I asked the captain as we were en route back to Whitehorse, I said, here's what I have in my mind. I'd like to get that light streak shot. And he'd commented on it. He said, oh, I've got it right here on my phone. And I said, but I want to go and freeze the aircraft in the light streaks. And I want the light streaks to continue. So I said, what I need to do is to take one of my studio strobes and fire it at you. And I said, is that going to cause any safety concerns with your forward vision, et cetera? We talked it up back and forth. And he said, as long as you're right underneath the aircraft, he said, we have strobes underneath us anyway with the approach path lighting. He said, it shouldn't be an issue. 
So there were a number of things that had to come together, though, for that shot. It took about a year in planning. Wow. wow. You know, one was certainly talking with uh, the, the, the captain, bantering around the idea with a few other pilots to see if there were any issues. What it took, though, is a new moon so that there could be no illumination, uh, light pollution from the moon itself. Uh, I would have liked northern lights, but I can't just dial them on when I like them or not. Needed the wind in the right direction. And with that shot, there's really only one approach in Whitehorse where you can get close enough to the touchdown point on the runway where the aircraft will be low enough yeah. for you to do that. It did look low. Yes. And it is, it is. And so you really only have one shot because they're, they're not going to come around and do it for you again. And so it's uh, approximately a 20 second exposure. It's pitch black. My biggest fear is kicking the leg of the tripod in the total darkness. And, and then th that that's that. And as the aircraft then goes over with an ultra wide angle lens looking up, popping the flash manually and then looking at the back of the camera and just hoping for the best. Wow. So uh, part of what brought it about was, you know, I always say that every arrival and takeoff is different and I can photograph them, but I was really looking for that different kind of concept yeah. of an aircraft that was dynamic as well as that it would show that it was an air North aircraft. It's a stu stunning uh, photograph. You know, you touched okay. on something actually, you said that you were in the cockpit and it's a, uh, um, it's a long, long time since I've flown jump seat, uh, and it would have gone back to the days of working in the BBC when you were able to go up the front. And of course, you can't now. You you clearly have that uh, that opportunity to uh, to fly with the uh, the flight crew and get your pictures of them actually in action, don't you? Yes, and if people ever look at my website, they'll probably see that they don't see any of those photos because I realize, you know, of course, that in terms of privacy and everything else, that. Those are photos that I upload to Air North. Yeah. Um, when I'm photographing the flight attendants doing their service, I'm in the back of the aircraft always looking forward so nobody would ever be identified. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've had to think of, and I also make sure I have to identify, and identify myself as Air North's photographer, that I'm there with a role, because I have had people tugging on my sleeve saying, how come you're photographing these flight attendants? Isn't that awfully in, in, invasive? You shouldn't be doing that. And then when I can say I'm actually here as part of my assignment and, and that's where the shirt comes in, the, the logo, the, the, uh, the company ID, the security pass, etc. And I also, too, when I, whenever I board the aircraft, I always go to the back of the galley beforehand and, and see the flight attendants and ask them, are they up for photos today? Yeah. Because if they're not, then the camera doesn't come out. So I, I make sure that uh, it's only with their permission that I do what I do. And it's quite the vote of confidence when one of your images ends up as a postage stamp, isn't it? Uh, well, <laughs> mi millions of people every day receiving mail with one of your pictures on the front. It, it is an Air North one, isn't it? Is, isn't it a, an aircraft one? Well, it is an aircraft one. What it is is that Canada Post has come out a couple of times with a series called Aviation in Canada, something along those lines, where they featured the aviation heritage that Canada has. Yeah. And this year, it's uh, uh, the de Havilland Beaver is being featured. And so what it'll be is a small booklet of stamps where they feature, you know, say the aeronautical engineers who are designed, designing it or the factory workers who made yeah. it. I've got the cover shot of the booklet itself. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, about this time last year, Canada Post contacted me and they found me out of the blue. And it's a, a photograph that I took probably 15 years ago of a, of a de Havilland beaver on a mountain lake. Wow. And uh, they've identified that as the cover. So, yeah, incredibly honoured. In terms of, of kit, because uh, we originally touched base because you had a, a, a situation, a problem photographing uh, aircraft with the new camera that you bought. You bought the Fujifilm X-T4. And I might, I might regret asking you this and certainly not asking you before I press record because you might not give me the answer I want. But um, have you swapped from, from Nikon or Nikon, as we say, to Fujifilm? Or, or are you m using a... A mixture now. I'm using a mixture. And the reason I'm doing that is I always like to have a camera with me. And uh, which means if I'm parking my vehicle somewhere, I don't want to have all of my full kit and find that somebody else would like to have it more than me, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So I always have a, I have a small bag with me and I have an X100V and I have the X or XT4. Yeah. And I've really fallen in love. I had the X100T, but I've fallen in love with the X100V. Uh, I, I carry that in my high-vis vest and being able to use that for um, that impromptu photo of the person refueling the aircraft, yes. the person loading the aircraft, where 
they have jobs to do and it's not my job to distract them for a photo. So if they're busy and they're under the gun to get an aircraft moving, the X-100V can come out. It's very unobtrusive, has quality that I'm very happy with, and it's a joy to use. So with the the X-T4, I, I pick that up as well so that if I'm having to hike around the airport to get to that sunny side, I'm not having to carry that 10 or 12 kilo bag of heavy glass mm. I can put that on and uh, uh, my, my smaller bag with the X-T4 and the X-100V and uh, feel well equipped. Well, your website has n- not only the, uh, the, um, the aircraft um, side, it also has some stunning landscape work on there. And, and something that's on my photographic bucket list to photograph, and you know exactly what I'm going to say probably now, the Northern Lights, which you are lucky enough to have in the Yukon where you live. Yes. Um, Depends on the year, though. There are certain years where they're really quite strong, and it's really based on solar activity. Mm. So there are some winters where we'll go and we'll have very few northern lights, or if we see them uh, of low intensity. And then there are other times where uh, earlier this fall, it will be incredible. We'll have, I, I can be out in my backyard in the early morning, and there will be this incredible display of northern lights. But I'm, t- I'm told that it, they look very different to the naked eye than they do to, to when you're photographing them. There, there's some sort of secret to, to photographing the northern lights successfully. Well, yes, and I think one of the, the factors behind what you described is that what our retinas can actually see and what can be captured, say, with a 10-second exposure with that 10 second ex- exposure, you'll often see more colors, different colors. You know, a trick, of course, is that you can't expose them too long, or they end up just being this green, blurry yeah. mess with no definition. Uh, so, what I find is with, say, a 16 millimeter full frame lens, you know, uh, about 20 to 25 seconds maximum, because then you're also going to start to get the star streaks. Mm-hmm. You won't have that pinpoint crisp, unless that's what you want. But with the northern lights, um, it's almost counterintuitive that the shorter exposures are sometimes better ones because then you capture them. If they're moving around quite quickly, you capture that definition. I, I want to come back to, to Dad. And there, there's there's a part of uh, of your relationship with Dad at the moment with a camera that I'd like to ask about. But but before we do that, um, it's, it's personal, I appreciate, but uh, it is important that... Um, Prior to dad passing, and something now that you champion, you found something, you found a a melanoma. Yes, I went for my annual medical in 2015, and my doctor, who had had previous service in Australia and knew what to look for, saw a lesion on my shoulder, which he said, I have concerns about. I had it removed, biopsied, and uh, it came back as melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer. Mm. Uh, The direction was to tell your three older brothers that they should get checked your dad, because they were your first blood relatives. My three brothers did immediately. And and dad, though, unfortunately, his response was, uh, you know, he said, not bloody likely. Uh, you know, if I, I went to the doctors every time I had a mole wart or pimple, I'd never be out in the lineup, he yeah, said. Yeah. Um, a year later, and mom had passed. She was a nurse, as I mentioned previously. Um, he found a, a lesion on his back, which was very aggressive. And in short order, he yeah, was diagnosed with melanoma, which moved to his lymph nodes. Mm. And he, he was slowly deconstructed by surgeries. And life went from being that 80 odd year old fellow who was out with his camera all the time, taking pictures of the neighbors to pain, demoralization, humiliation. And in 2018, he chose to go out under full sail uh, so to speak, through medical assistance in dying because the cancer was so aggressive. And so I, I feel, I'll be honest, I feel a certain measure of guilt and responsibility of the fact that he didn't go, but he wouldn't listen. And uh, so what I've done now is to anybody who will listen, I, I mentioned sun protection, early detection, look after yourself, see your doctor if you have any concerns, um, because melanoma is easily detectable. It's one of the few cancers we can see because it's external. And if it's detected early, it has a very high success treatment rate. Well, I know, I know that you've you've campaigned now for this. Well, I've I've spoken in photography with respect to the, the dangers of overexposure, both in terms of sun as well as in our photography. Yeah. And uh, whenever I presented on photography, I, I try and weave in 
the, the fact we photographers we are out so often yeah, we're outdoors yeah, yeah yeah it's an outdoor pursuit very much so so given the fact that you know our skin is our largest organ that it is detectable that it is preventable yeah. My oldest brother, uh, he has just been diagnosed with melanoma. So that's three of us now. And so uh, it appears that there's a genetic component yeah. and I'm going to be tested to determine that for my sons, yeah. my two sons' sake. Well, I hope that works. So, I hope that works out. Um, but while we talk about that, one thing that you said that uh, I particularly uh, was fond of, um, you said some of your happiest times with him were when you were out with a camera together. Absolutely. There were times when mum would go back to visit my grandparents in Leicester and he and I would be home. And on the weekends, we would pack up that picnic hamper. We'd set a few sites that we wanted to go see. Uh, we were living in Calgary at the time, so the mountains were very close by. And just to go out for a day with the cameras together, those were the happiest memories that I have of him. And sadly, I look back, they were too infrequent but this may sound strange but with my connection to photography it allows me to still carry on a relationship with him yeah. in a way that's very meaningful as that might sound a bit strange now that he's no longer physically with us but i he's still with me whenever i'm out with my camera who would have won a print competition between you i'm <laughs> careful I'm gonna give it careful to, careful I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna give it to him because his his skill in the dark room was something uh, that i admired so much his black and white printing, like I say, that that's what hooked me. But I, I'd give it to Dad. Uh, thanks to Simon Blakesley for his time. And to see his work, go to all the W's, Simon Blakesley, B-L-A-K-E-S-L-E-Y dot C-A. If you like your country music, be sure to go to incapablestaircase.com on Thursdays at 3.30pm. I'm sure by now you don't need me to tell you that Kev is a ginormous country music fan. But just in case it passed you by, Kev has uh, the alter ego Country Boyo and uh, his radio name, that is, for the IncapableStaircase.com show every single Thursday at that 3.30. His idea of bliss being a hot tub in the heart of Lower Broadway in Nashville. Headphones on, listening to anything by Johnny Cash. Uh, you can also play catch up to any shows that you've missed. Go to IncapableStaircase.com. And then on Fridays, I have my photo walk show. And this week, this Friday, it is a special. You'll be joining me on the photo walk retreat uh, with the housemates taking place on the Isle of Wight. So don't just bring your earbuds, bring your boots too, as we capture the, the essence of the walks taken, the conversations and the challenges. Photography Daily, the photo walk show is available wherever you get your podcasts and at photographydaily.show. Right, back to your questions. Let's go for a, another Facebook one because we're a, we're a bit low on the the email ones, Kev. Bit bit low. Okay. Well, this is more of a suggestion really. In fact, there's two suggestions, so um I'll read those out. Uh Ivan Creef Hello, Kevin Mullins and Neil James. Very so formal. formal, yeah. yeah. Well, I have a book recommendation for you for your respective libraries, Bruce Gildin's Cherry Blossom. It's a collection of oh. Gildin's Japanese photographs from 1995. It spans all segments of Japanese society. There are a lot of Bruce Gildin iconic photos of the Yakuza. Well worth getting. Yours, Ivan Creef. Keep up the powder. Keep your powder dry and protect your top knot. That's right, at all times. Have you got Ski any? Took Oklahoma. Have you got any Gildan books? Yeah, and in fact, I'm fairly sure we've de we've done that one. That rings a bell that from my book one. collection. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm sure we way way back in the in the annals of time. <laughs> Not annals, is it? When I was annals. Of time. <laughs> you get very veterinary on me. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was the other suggestion? Uh, Laurie Rowland interview guest suggestion. Um, an idea for a guest. I just saw an article about an amazing photographer, Charles Brooks. Oh, photographs the interior of musical instruments. Now I saw this. Yes, I did see this. Uh, and I didn't see this before Laurie posted this question. This is absolutely phenomenal. 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 What's phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal about it? It is. Um, just search for, if you want to read, look at this stuff, search for Charles Brooks. That's with no E in Brooks. B-R-O-O-K-S and musical instruments. That's all you need to. Charles you need Brooks, to, musical instruments. Yep. Photographs. Photographs, yeah. And prepare to have your mind blown out of the planet. Right, let me press this book here. Oh, this. You should be on oh, the, pa the pages. This is colossal. This, yes, this is not at all like 
<laughs> the sort of music photography I'm used to. It's inside musical instruments. Wow. Yeah, look at it inside the piano. That's fantastic. It looks like wow. it looks like the air conditioning ducts of a. It does, yeah. Or, or or in one of them, the the didgeridoo looks like a cave. Oh my word, that is really weird. It's fantastic, isn't it? I yeah. think it's absolutely. You know, this 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 pokes one in the eye for everybody who says there's nothing new to photograph. No, no, no. There's no yeah. there you go. Get yourself oh. inside a musical instrument. This block must be tiny. How on earth? <laughs> I was going to say, how is, I mean, he's <laughs> using the sort of things that the, the, the special air services or whatever put put into up grates and things to get pictures of uh, where, where, you know. I yeah, mean, I it, don't know. I haven't read to see how he's doing it, but um, beyond the technology of what camera he's using, which, it, you know, ultimately, let's think about it. You could take the sensor out of a... Uh, a GoPro, as long as it's got a lens and the sensor, you could take all of the, probably get most of a GoPro camera inside if you took all of the bulky nuts out of it. The quality doesn't look like a GoPro here, though, at all. Yeah, but don't forget, this is very close-up pictures. No, that's true. So, true yeah. I don't know. I'm not saying it's GoPro, but what I'm saying is I don't think the actual getting a camera inside would be the issue. It's the lighting of it that I think is phenomenal. Oh. Like, how has the light got into these these holes and crevices? That, I think, is is just mind-blowing. I have never seen work like this before. Uh, really, this is yeah. Well, there we go. That that's a that's a great suggestion, Kev. Yeah, it is. And so, uh, yeah, like like Niels alluded to, we can't really post this on the page at the minute because on the uh, website because uh, it broke. However, if you go to the Facebook group and you search in the thread, you will see the the link that Laurie kindly posted. It's a website called thisiscolossal.com. But if you just search Charles Brooks and this is colossal and music photography and stuff, you'll find it. Perfect. And it is. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. All right. I just wanted to do that again. Good good suggestion. Good suggestion. Right. Do you have a question from Facebook too? Hang on, I'm getting an emoji. I don't know what's what's the best emoji for for mind blown. Oh, hang on. There's a mind blown one. Is there a mind blown emoji? Yeah, there's one with the head blown up. Where's it gone? Okay. It's right next to all the Halloween ones. They should take those off now. Uh, There we go. Mind blown. Boom. Right. Proper question. Yes. Question. <laughs> Although that was a really good um, tip, that. I would imagine we might get some response on that because that's fantastic. I'm looking at it now thinking, wow, that's just, it is. I mean, it looks almost like somebody's CGI'd this, but it's not. It's real. No, I know. Yeah. I may well try and drop him a line. Although I suspect with the publication of that, he's a very busy person. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what? I think I've run it quite on. Um... No. Oh, no, no, there, there's, there's some, <laughs> hidden, some hidden. There's some hidden. We, got, we ago. got a way to go yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the way, face, the way Facebook folds up threads is stupid. It tries to tell you which ones it thinks you're most interested in. And I'm mm. like, no, I, I'll make that decision. Thank you very much. I want much. them all. Thank you very much. Metaverse. Yeah. Right. Oh, and also, Mia Master's uh, similar thread um, said, can you have a look at uh, speaking to Trent Park? <laughs> oh, yes, Trent Park. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, and after that list. we'll we'll try and get the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Trent will oh, say, Trent, yeah, he knows. Oh, Park. He'll, yeah, he'll say, Mullins, no problem. He'll say that that's fine. I've been trying to get an interview with um, our favourite musician who still owes me twenty quid. That now that one is proving impossible. Mm. I, I I don't think that uh, Brian Adams is ever going to say yes. I've I've now resorted to the you owe me twenty quid email. Well, and also good old Joe <laughs> Rogan has has managed to. With one fell sweep, basically make podcasters around the world look like idiots. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, what what he's done is is that he's um, actually increased the conversation about podcasts being a a medium that people take seriously now. You, you, you know, he took that show from effectively a bedroom with a with only geeks that knew how to down, download a podcast to a platform that. That, that realise the spoken word is um, as powerful as music. And whatever, whatever you feel about him as a person or interviewer, he doesn't exactly carry the ownership of misinformation. And I can't really see a queue of people at his door to talk with him is going to diminish in the slightest. I, I mean, 11, 11 million people per episode, Kev, is an inviting number for any guest, isn't it? 11 million per episode. Mm-hmm. Even in the big And day, you can only listen on Spotify, can't you? Mm, I know. So what he's effectively done is he's he said, well, here, here's a medium, sit up, take notes. Potentially, although I think a lot of high-flying celebs and stuff like that might be thinking right now, I'm not going on a podcast just for the time being. Well, but I, 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 maybe, but celebrities have never stopped going on terrestrial telly or radio shows because one network stirred a hornet's nest, have they? Anyway, let's um, let's move on, Kev. 
<laughs> Otherwise, Just I can see bad. You, you'll fall over and start snoring. Just to be very bad. Uh, no, I won't because I've just had my turmeric tablets. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm lucky enough. I'm lucky <laughs> enough to have a personal project funded. Yeah. Ooh, that's very oh. nice. I've decided on using the Svelte XE3 with three lenses, Ooh. the 18mm f2, 35mm f1.4 and a 50mm f2 nice. to be as minimal as possible. If you could choose any three lenses and one body to photograph your entire project, what would you choose? Cheers from West Hartford, Connecticut, USA. Yeah. Been cold there, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Valerie Jardin the other day. She's in Minneapolis. And I said, uh, I said to her, Oh, it looks quite that looks cozy, your room. She said, Yeah, it's th- minus thirty six outside. <laughs> What was that thing you said last week? Minus 35 feels like minus 36. Yeah. <laughs> Go on then, Kev. What, what what would you choose if you're shooting a... Uh, it depends a little bit on what the project was, Yeah, I have to say. So if it was a documentary style project, then um, uh, my X-Pro3 with 18 1.4, 56 1.2. What else? And a 23. Wow. Got to be a 23, Kev. No, because I got my eighteen. No, twenty three. Nah, don't like. I've fallen out of love with that. Have you? Uh, yeah, uh, eighteen. Well, thirty five then. Mm, yep, I don't think I've ever used that. You've got mine for a start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'd need three. I'd eighteen fifty six, and maybe I'd go for one of the f two faster f two prime lenses. I mean, the the smaller f two prime lenses. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, you're right. Maybe the thirty-two, uh, thirty-five F two, oh. just to. Uh, oh no, hang on. What am I on about? I'm talking like a old school person. Thirty-three mil lens, the right. new thirty-three mil lens. You would use that. I've got that. Yeah, Good. that that's the one. Yeah, because although I don't use it. <laughs> well, the other it. way to do it would be to do the way that Simon Blakesley was uh, suggesting, where he he carries, um, you know, a body with interchangeable lenses, but. He kind of feels like the uh, um, the the twenty three millimeter lens is effectively his X one hundred, which he loves, yeah. which he can use for all the uh, all those moments where he doesn't want to look necessarily like a well, not necessarily like a photographer, but he doesn't doesn't want to draw too much attention, and so the mm-hmm. X one hundred comes out. That's effectively like his his third lens, if you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so another way of doing it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. What about you then? Well, I haven't used the 18, and I would be really, I, I really would love to try this 18, Kev. Maybe. So, so I would probably have said 16, 23, and 56. Mm. I, I would use the 35, but I've, I've now got it in a glass cabinet that says this belonged <laughs> to Mullins. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's now a museum piece. <laughs> Next um, to my 61 4, 2 uh, 4. Yes, I've got your 60 as well. You're absolutely right, Kev. Where's the 60? 60. Yeah, it's there. Oh, Kev, I'll return that to you. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. You, I don't use it. You can use If you're still using it for filming, that's all good with me. Apologies, apologies. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I do use it from time to time. I've not been doing a lot of films, though. I've kind of... I got that email from YouTube saying uh, we've withdrawn the, your um, your ability to make money from the channel anymore because I haven't made enough films. Oh, really? Yeah. They've, fr- mm. they've thrown me off, Kev. Well, they haven't thrown me off. They've, um, they've stopped your monetization. Stopped my monetization. When, when was the last time you put anything on there, then? Uh, oh, ages and ages and ages ago. Far more than six months, I think. Well, I mean, I went I went for a good 15 months without putting anything on there. Oh, yeah, but you're, you're Mullins. They need, <laughs> they need you. They don't need me. So, I, yeah, uh, I, got, I got demonetized. Demonetized, Kev. Demonetized. <laughs> He monetized. I, I can't say it was bringing in much money anyway, so it's not made a huge difference to my life. <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting. Uh, maybe they've changed the rules a bit then. I'll yeah. brought the, the timeline a bit closer. That might be it. I mean, I can't remember. The, um, it doesn't really encourage you to go ahead and try and do a bit more, does it? Well, uh, it, it, yeah, it didn't fill me with the joys of spring. No, I've, I've got to say. But, um, but there we go. Right, Will Collin. Now, I, I meant to play this... Um, last week to you I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it will come across well but i'm i'm i did take the time to upload it to the machine so i'm gonna i'm gonna have a go okay following up on my question about the xc3 and whether its shutter is too noisy compared to my xt4 he did a test using a sound meter he picked up from the middle of Lidl. you get you get sound meters in Lidl. no really so you can get all sorts in Lidl. well it's impressive fantastic wow. i love it can you get cat- the middle of Lidl. can you get caterpillars uh, probably. Chocolate caterpillars. Caterpillar, caterpillar like cakes. 
So it's maybe not completely scientific, but I've tried to keep everything comparable. I used the same shutter speed of 1 60th, turned off autofocus, and set the lenses to maximum aperture so there couldn't be any sound from the diaphragm blades stopping down. Oof, this is proper science, I think. And I compared them to my old film SLR, the, uh, the classic Olympus OM30 from 1983, which was also set to 1 60th in manual with the lens at maximum aperture. Turns out that I was completely wrong, and Kevin was right to be sceptical when I said the XE3 is as loud as an SLR. It's not. That's what he found. That's that's what you said, Kev. The X-T4 yeah. is the quiet. So here, here's an X-T4, which is a very quiet camera. That doesn't make it sound very quiet, though, does it? Maybe I should do it like this. Hold on. That's better, isn't it? Sounds like a caterpillar chewing on a piece of lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, okay. Uh, the X-E3... <laughs> Fair bit louder at 62.5 decibels. So, so the first one was 47. XE3 is 62.5 decibels. I wonder if you could have told... I, I should have done this, Kev. Started by saying, do you, do you know the difference between the shutter noises? Yeah, uh, but I would need the reference of volume yeah. up front. But, but that second one, it's interesting. The XE3 sounds not only a little no, bit louder, but the... XE3. Uh, XE3. The first one was XT4. Uh, XT4. And then XE3 was next, was it? Yeah. So XT, it is, XT4 is this one. And then XE3 is this one. Yeah, there's a, it's elongated as well. It's a little bit longer in its... It does sound it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'd have loads of fun with this. <laughs> would you be doing this all day long yeah I'd just be making music videos with the sound of shutter noises Actually, you could couldn't you bring in the beat hang on I'll get my guitar hang on <laughs> have you got your guitar, guitar? we'll do the XE3 song <laughs> XE3 rap <laughs> but the Olympus he yeah, says once was a camera called XE3 <laughs> <laughs> don't start rapping but the Olympus is much much louder at a whopping 79 decibels there we go Oh, but that no, that sounded quieter to me. Well, does it? This is XE3, XT4, and the Olympus. <laughs> mm, yeah, that sounds like a typewriter. I remember my old Canon 1D Mark IV. That was loud. Good camera, but loud. I yeah. wonder what that sound like these days. I don't think you can get them anymore. So the original email was uh, that he was fascinated to hear that you discovered you, you like shooting with a shutter sound turned on with your X100V. Yeah. Yeah, so there we go. Thank you very much for recording them, Will. <laughs> and expect the, um, the the song to come out soon, the rap song. Go on then, Kev. Back to the questions. Facebook. Uh, Robert Ham, uh, question re Instagram versus Flickr. I know that Instagram has become mostly the platform of choice from photographers, but Flickr has the benefit of easily showing EXIF data. Oh. And this provides much education for rank amateurs such as myself. Do you think Instagram will ever stop stripping EXIF or could there be an add on that enables it? Thanks from Robert in Menlo Park. So I have to admit, because I've never looked, I had no idea that insta stripped the exif yeah well there's no real reason for them to have it there is there because it's not displayed anywhere you don't look at an image it doesn't say in the bottom right hand corner sony no whatever lens this lens that so there's no real reason and obviously with the amount of images being uploaded to instagram the smaller the files they can make it the better and taking the exif data out does make it a little bit smaller so I honestly, I, I can't really see the benefit of having EXIF data. I mean, I can see the benefit in terms of you see a picture and you think, oh, I love that. I want what that, what was that shot on? And yes, that interests me also. However, Instagram isn't really, I mean, you, you know, you've got all of the, you know, it's not just photographers that use it. It's basically the whole planet and sharing pictures of their makeup, their hair, their feet, their, you know, yeah, husband, yeah. boyfriend, yeah, all of that stuff. It's not, it's not a learning platform, is it? It's a sharing platform. Whereas Flickr, to a certain extent, is more of a professionally geared platform. Um, and yeah, I mean, I always, I always liked on Flickr that you could see the exit data and everything like that as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, I don't know is the answer. I wouldn't have thought so. Is my thing take on opinion. it? Right. Um, here's one from Mike Miller. Uh, dear Neil, dear Kev, happy new. Oh, we're not supposed to say that, are we? Just mm -hmm. uh, no, we can't say that. Rewind. It wasn't so long ago that he sent this, though. Um, is there a definitive book on the subject of wedding photography? If there is, can you please provide us with a title and author? But if there isn't such a treatise in existence yet, when will the two of you, in partnership with Anna McCarthy, be finishing the transcript for publication? <laughs> 
Will the book be ready in time to purchase prior to Christmas of 2020, 20, 2022? Anna McCarthy is referenced there, by the way, because she did some fabulous work at the BBC working on books for um, all manner of people, famous people too. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why Anna is mentioned there. Um, the reason for asking is that I have a relative who's working on their third spouse, and I have a feeling that they may be asking me to image their wedding. Having never worked a wedding before as a paid photographer, I'd need to prepare, and for me, books are the most efficient way to get started finding the answers to the questions. I don't yet know to ask. Best regards from Mike Miller. Yeah, there we go, Kev. We have talked Um, so so often about doing something, haven't we? We talked about doing an audio book. Yeah, I mean, I, I I spoke to my publishers about doing a wedding photography book. Yeah, um, and they basically said that no, it is it wouldn't sell enough. Oh, really? Um, Why? So, well, because basically they've done the research already, and it, it, they they just don't sell. Well, um, and the niche of know. weddings. I thought wedding were well, wedding photography. Well, I suppose actually in a, in a local market, no. But if you were well, looking you, in the grand scheme of things, when yeah. you think about it not that many wedding photographers in the world is there you know the, to make a, a book and publish it worldwide is is a big commitment that anyway was, yeah. that said yeah. um um uh, <laughs> oh god no, the kids have just walked in that's why i'm huffing and puffing uh, the um what's his majiggy you know the thingy um well, i've got two here Kevin. love glove love glove love glove damien love glove oh, he did make a yes, very good book back in the day well i've got two more here though uh, one which was Joe Busink, who wrote, um, yes. who, who did something about his coverage of the Jessica Simpson uh, wedding, which is simply called "I Do." So that's a bit, a bit niche, I suppose. But this one, again, it's from um, it's from Joe Busink uh, and Skip Cohen, forward by Dennis Reggie. Um, yeah. This is, a, I mean, there's some good names there in the wedding world. Creative techniques to capture the moments that matter. Wedding photography from the from heart. heart. Yes. Correct. This is so, a very good book. I have that book, indeed. And the, a lot of people will be listening to the name Skip Cohen, maybe less so Joe Boosink, um, and Dennis Reggie, and thinking, who are they? Um, yes. And rightly so, because they're, they're, they're no longer really on the scene, although Dennis Reggie was the... Was, uh, technically, or, or whether it's true or not, the person who invented wedding photojournalism. Oh. That man has got bigger and better and bushier eyebrows than me. So <laughs> I feel very affiliated to me and Dennis. Boom, <laughs> fist bump, Dennis. Um, but however, all of that stuff was way before YouTube and the internet came along and, yes. and cannibalized yes. the learning platforms. So that's why the publishers these days, that's why you want, you're unlikely to see new books on that such a niche topic. I'm not saying it can't happen. I, maybe there are some out there. I don't know that. But there's a reason. Um, and that's, you know, YouTube is, is, is basically killing off that kind of marketplace. But mm. that said, uh, yes, that one, I did have that. I don't have it any longer. I don't know where it went. But that Joe Bursig one, where did, I remember reading that when I was right at the beginning of my journey i promise you this is my book i've not borrowed it like uh, no, no, no 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 i would have gone um <laughs> i remember reading it in a hot tub oh. in uh center parks right <laughs> it would have been before kids as well uh yeah hang on a minute yeah. you were in a hot tub with a lovely Gemma. um before you Gemma was there before you had kids well i'm hoping she was no uh, she would have been in in the house probably all right well, so you're in, you're in, so you're on, you're on a lovely romantic break with the lovely Gemma. No, no, no. Her mum was there. What's your mum? Mum paid for it. Yeah, right. That's right. I remember so now. You're there, in a romantic. No way we could afford a centre park. It's one of those accommodations with a hot tub. <laughs> you're on a romantic holiday with Gemma and her mum, <laughs> and Tom. Although Tom's dead now. <laughs> and uh, oh, bless Tom. And but you're sitting in a hot tub reading, reading a wedding book by Joe Busink. Yep. Kev, you, um, you. The world is good. <laughs> the world, the world is right. You do love your hot tubs, though, don't you? Oh. I'm really surprised, by the way, that you never bought yourself a hot tub. Oh no, the maintenance and the running costs and that, and and if you think your your dog barking annoys the neighbours, <laughs> you want to see me in a hot tub? It will annoy the, my neighbours. Why? why? 
why would uh, perhaps I should be on the Facebook group make moms be better what? what's that <laughs> have you seen this Dutch thing that keeps getting in that noisy water in the garden in Gloucester Road but they're not too noisy are, are they really noisy like a monster from the deep um, <laughs> yeah they're reasonably noisy aren't they alright all right. okay I think you can literally spend days in a hot tub. I know that's, oh, that's the easy. thing you look forward to most when you go on holiday, isn't it? As long as yeah. you've got a hot tub, it's all right for Mullins. Um, but you can get the blow-up ones, of course. You can get those ones that you... Um, the, the yeah, you can. The you can deliver, ones. can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, can, you can borrow one for the weekend. Try it out, mm. yeah, see what the neighbours think. Mm. Well, that's, that's it for this week. If you've liked today's show and your, your podcast player is one of those flavours that lets you, and of course you feel it's relevant, then uh, we'd love you to leave a review. Um, thank you to our friends who uh, support us on Patreon. Um, see you in the Facebook group for any questions that you may have about today's show. Play nice, of course. Our mods, Steve and Pete, are in there to keep an eye on stuff. Uh, send any question. Yeah, we could do some more email ones now. Send any questions, stories about your work, and anything of interest you think listeners will enjoy or learn from via the email click at fujicast.co.uk or through the Facebook group. There'll be a post pinned to the top so you can do that uh, thank you to our guests this week uh, Simon Blakesley and uh, music from Blue Wednesday supporting music from the incredible artlist.io we will see you next week bye 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 the Fujicast is an independent loading zone production email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way. <laughs>